Okay, guys, oral sessions. Today I am joined by Sarah Logan, a.k.a. Well, Sarah Rowe, a.k.a. Sarah Logan. You got to say it like that way, obviously. Was it weird for you ditching the Sarah Logan part? Um, Luckily, it's always been Sarah, so I never had to, like, answer anything different. Like, like when Ruby and Dory, like, yeah, yeah, that was difficult for me it was like I want my son to call her Dory but I've been calling her yeah. Ruby for freaking years <laughs> it was it, it was a legitimate struggle to change up the name so I'm the I'm glad the first name is the same but uh yeah it's 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 weird just just being a non-wrestling character for once in a you know I've been wrestling since I was 17 so yeah it was, it was, it was pretty weird yeah it's like weird to shake that identity I imagine do you like do you associate that so much with like who you are as a person I guess luckily the longer I wrestled like the less I associated it with like my whole being like the more like you know like the farm and being a mom and being married and you know like all the stuff Mm -hmm. I have going on here I was able to kind of like create a separate identity instead of wrestling which yeah you're Bruce Wayne yeah (laughs) exactly like Bruce Wayne okay what have you been up to what's happening what is going on in your life it's so nice to see your face yeah, it's um, it's been crazy. Um, I, we we have a fully functioning farm now. We have six cows, about to be seven any day now. One of our cow- cows is about to calf. We have a full like regenerative agriculture farm. We have chickens. We have a full commercial gym that just me and Ray use. Um, I've had a child. Uh, I've written a children's book. Um, I feel like the YouTube channel is 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 awesome and going. Um, I don't know. Just, I don't think I forget anything. Yeah. <laughs> this calf that's being born, are you going to deliver this calf? So awesome thing about the cows we have. So we have Scottish Highland cows, like those fluffy cows that everyone the freaks cute out ones. about. Yes. Yeah. So these cute cows are the oldest recorded breed ever. Like from like the sixth century, they were the first recorded breed of any animal. So oh. they, they're like, it's what's called a heritage breed. And what's awesome about heritage breeds is they haven't really been messed with. So like the cows that like Angus cows or Hertford cows, they kind of have calves that are too big for their bodies because of kind of what they've been fed and how they've been bred and yada, yada, yada. The Highland cows don't have that issue. So like if I have to go out there and help pull this calf, it might not make it. It's probably not going to make it. Like they, mm. they go in a corner of the woods by themselves and I'll wake up and there's a calf on the ground. I'm like, there's a new wow. baby outside. Ah. So this has happened already on your farm. You've already had twice now. Yeah. Wow. Two calves. We have two, like they're probably one's five months old. One's four months old. Yeah. How do you not bring them in the house? Cause they are cute as all hell. <laughs> so they're like very similar to like Buffalo. Like they're okay. very like present if we have food, but like the calves, like want nothing to do. Like I've touched them once when they were first born to like check the sex and one like almost kicked me in the face. Like they're, <laughs> they love the food. They're always present for that. But once you have any yeah. food, they're like, get out. And they got horns, you know, so you got to oh watch out for those. God. Yeah. Um, okay. I've got more on the cows. I'm going to circle back to that in a second. In the children's book, what's happening here? What is the concept of the book? Is it being published? What's going on? So we're shopping publishers right now. Um, it is a Did my uh, girl help you out. Oh, she's I just got a talk to her. She's fantastic. She's oh been, my god, so good. Yay. She's like, we got all these publisher companies lined up. And I'm like, awesome, you're you feel so wanted. Thank you. So I thought of this book when I was trying to put my son to sleep. Um, it's about a left-handed kid and like a right-handed kid's world, right? He's like the only left-handed kid in his class. Real Ned um, Flanders. Yes. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm so special. I write with my left hand and no one else does. Like everyone look how awesome and special I am. And no one really acknowledges him that he's super special for having his left hand. So he gets so embarrassed. So he storms out of class and he's like, I'm going to show the world that they think should think I'm special. And so he starts doing these things that, um, that are kind of I don't know if anyone's ever seen South Park, like Professor Chaos. He does things that are like evil villainous, but like no one even notices because they're so small. So it's a book series of him doing things as a supervillain, like a little kid supervillain to make the world left-handed because he feels like he should be more special. When the moral of the story is, you're special just in yourself. Like you don't have to act out to be special. Like you are special. And that's the, 
That's the. Are you, are you a lefty? Is this where this came from? So I was supposed. I wanted to be, but at my school <laughs> they were like, "No, right with your right hand." And I was like, "Oh." So now I'm I'm kind of ambidextrous because of it, which is cool. But I wanted to be a lefty, but my school was like, Meh. <laughs> "So do you have like jacked up writing because of that?" And it's not the best, you know. It's not the best. It's. I it's, mean, who has good writing these days? Though, it's passable. Right? My, my writing, thumb, my thumbs are great at writing. <laughs> you can type just fine. Yeah, yeah, type just fine. That's crazy. They wouldn't let you write with your left hand. They just they tried to correct that right off the bat. Yeah, they, they were, and I didn't even like tell my parents because like I didn't think to. I was just like, oh okay, I'll write with my right hand. Like after like half the day of writing with my left hand, they're like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't know. Just just it's my first day. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Okay. So the book is happening. You're shopping out to some publishers. Is it illustrated? Has like how, what, how it's kind of ready to go. Like I presented it as like, here's the book. Let's wow. sell it. Who illustrated so, it? Um, this guy on Instagram, um, he, his name's Eric Lervoy. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, he is a, um, he's, he's an, he writes like comic books and all kinds of stuff for like wrestlers. So, um, I, he like illustrated something for me, like as like Sarah Logan or in like did some farm stuff. And I was like, Hey, I'm thinking of writing this children's book. He's like, seriously, that's what I do. I I'm an illustrator. And I was like, Oh no. And we, I just told him about the book. He's like, this is a great idea. And it, he drew it all out. Oh, that's awesome. Oh my God. I can't wait to see this. I'm nervous. I'm like, it needs to be awesome. Yeah. I mean, like the book process is so slow of like getting it done and what the deadlines are and when's it going to actually be out. And then once it's out, it blows your mind when the, when you get to actually see the first copy of the book, it's I, so I surreal. Even, I have it's 11 a trip. or 10 nieces and nephews that are like, most of them are under the age of like eight. So I'm just going to be like mother go. goose with all the books. Yeah. It's mother Damn. Goose, right? All right, sweet. So that's happening. Um, I can bring things back to the cows now because I wanted to talk about farm life. Why did you and Ray decide that farm life was the way to go for you guys? Because it seems <sighs> you guys started kind of getting into it already before you left WWE. It was our, the, the yeah. wheels were in motion for that. And what part of Ohio were you guys in again? If uh, unless you share. No, no, I, I, I can do a general. We're, we're in like the Cleveland area, like Northern okay. Ohio. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Close to Canada. Not quite. Like uh, no, it's not too bad. And every now and then you can find yourself at Tim Hortons. Yes. So I mean, yeah, sure. take it. I'll, <laughs> I, I, I like Cleveland. I actually, I mean, I have to like Ohio, my other side of my, like John's family is all from Ohio. Yeah. So I, I feel like I'm like sort of Ohio in esque. It's similar to Canada. Uh, we'll, um, we'll take you. That's it. It's fine. <laughs> we need, we know we can in. get at this point. Yeah. Take me <laughs> in. Okay, so why, yeah, why did this happen? Why did you guys, and where do you even start? How do you start a f farm? Land. You need land, which is, well, I mean, you don't need a lot of land. Like a lot of people have a fully functioning farm on like two acres. Um, mm -hmm. We have 50 out here in Ohio. Um, and honestly, like, so when people watch those like terrible videos of like animals being tortured and food lots and the butchering process and all that stuff, so when people watch that stuff, it makes them want to stop eating meat altogether, right? Sure. Like I'm going vegetarian, I'm going vegan. I'm not going to support this. My, when I watch that kind of stuff, I think I'm going to raise my own. I'm going to become part of the process and try to make it better, you know, make it more sustainable, more, yeah. you know, like our cows are going to have like one bad day. Like we're going to butcher them here. We're going to slaughter them here. Um, they're not going to be sent off to a, a food lot. And cause like a lot of, a lot of butchering places, like won't take cattle with horns. So like they cut their horns off before they butcher them. Why won't they take the horns? It damages up a bunch of stuff. Like it's just, oh. it's, it's, it's purely like a cost benefit kind of thing. Got it. But, um, we choose to grass feed our cows. We chose a breed that isn't as big as other cows. So like Normally, if you want to do beef cattle, you get like Angus cows, like black Angus. Um, we did the Highlands. They have, um, it takes us like twice as long to grow a cow up to butchering weight, feeding it grass than it does corn. Weight. Um, probably like for the, for the cows here, probably like 1600 pounds. Okay. Jesus. And so we grass feeding to that point can be done and it's how it used to be done, but it takes about twice as long. 
So I can understand why, you know, that big butchering companies are just trying to get cows the biggest and the fastest as they can, because that's like the most profitable. However, like it's destroying like the ground, like literally. And so we choose, and even like corn and soybeans and stuff like that, like it just takes from the ground. It doesn't give back. So how farming used to be done, even if you're growing corn, you would grow corn, corn would grow, you would harvest it. You'd put the cows on the harvested corn stalks, the cows would eat it down. And then the cows, obviously when they eat, they poop and the poop and the cows put CO2 back into the ground and then you can grow again. So we're just doing the, so like that's after you see a corn field that's been like harvested, mm-hmm. it looks like a barren wasteland. Like you have to pump chemicals back into that soil to get it to grow again. And that used to be done with animals and it's how the ecosystem works. You know, it's, yeah. it's how those yeah. kind of things work. So we have pasture here, we grow our own hay. Um, so the cows kind of are giving back to the earth. They're giving back to the cows and the cows are giving to us. So we kind of want to leave our, you know, like leave this piece of ground for our kids and our kids' kids. So like, you're going to be able to live here and have like a great, fantastic life. You would not leave the property. Oh yeah. Laying down <laughs> that groundwork. Yes. Which- how, like, how happy were you in this past year and a half that you guys are so self-sustainable with everything that you oh, have here? Like you probably never had to leave your property. No, no like not really. Especially because we hunt and we hunt for meat, like yeah. almost exclusively. Like people think when you have like a mount on your wall, like a deer that the meat was wasted. And when that's just like the skin. Yeah. And so like we have freezer full of deer, like me and Ray each get about six deer a year. And Damn. so like my son this morning ate a backstrap off a deer that we had hunted and it freaking warms my heart, you know? So between, Damn. cause we have, we have 20 acres of, of kind of like pasture for our cows and we have 30 acres of woods behind it. Yeah. And we're just constantly pulling food off this, like, and the chickens and cows work together. So the cows poop and the chickens go up to the cow poop and they scratch it and they spread it around and it fertilizes stuff even more. So the you chickens live at the right grass. There. It, it, it makes me so happy to look outside and be like, look at all the things that are happening. How did you learn to butcher your own meat? Because you, you were doing that prior to you guys starting your own farm. I mean, you've hunted right. for a long time. Yeah. How do you learn to do that? Who kind of guided you through figuring all that out? And were you a little terrified the first time you did it? So you're... Um, kind of, I had like the traditional kind of hunting story where like my family did it and they passed it on to me. Ray is a adult onset hunter. Like he didn't hunt until I showed him, but like, honestly, showed him the ways, showed him the yes. ropes. but like, honestly, by the time you're in the butchering process, you're so invested in what you're doing. And like, that's the reason you put that animal down. Yeah. So like, I think the taking the animal is the hardest part. And the butchering part, like, I can understand if you're like squeamish with blood or something where it could get like, you know, sure. but it's just something I always grew up around. And like, it's such a respect part of the animal. Like, I don't go hunting for birds. Like, I don't really like turkey hunting, pheasant hunting, because I hate processing birds. I hate plucking them. They're freaking gross. Omnivores <laughs> as a species are gross. Yeah. And like with, with deer, like I enjoy the process because I work so hard for the hunt. I've trained all year long to make that shot for the animal. I'm butchering it and not waste, try not to waste any kind of meat. And then after you butcher it, you pack it together and then you eat it for like a year. So damn, it's, it's such like a rewarding thing to kind of know where your food comes from. Um, each cow that you have. So you said you've got six coming on seven. Yes. Um, how long will a cow last you for? When you uh, do get to the point of butchering and eating this cow. One cow would probably last us because of how much we eat meat. Probably like a year, year and a half. Wow. But we eat a lot more meat than the average family, you know, um, especially with cash. And we give our family meat. Like we're like, like let's have the milkman. We're like the meat man. We come and drop off steaks. Um, and because we have we only butcher bulls and steers. So we only butcher boys. So Highland cow females can reproduce for like 18 years. So if a girl is keeping producing for us and she's not mean, (laughs) 
we're going to we're going to keep them and uh our we we bought two girls and a boy um and the girls had both calves we have another girl that we just bought who's pregnant and the bull his name is wally he if he keeps producing sons we'll just keep reproducing him like he's a good bull he's great he protects the girls he he's top freaking bull and um and his sons will when they're about nine months old will castrate them and so they can't breed their moms that would be a mess nobody and- <laughs> that's not a good idea no. at all no that, i never even thought of that damn once they get tall enough you have to do something you have to separate them you have to castrate them you have to butcher them and they won't be nearly otherwise you get like a wacky yeah because like first thing like it wouldn't be like sat like the hills have eyes like deformities yet <laughs> not like the but cows if it kept would, going if it kept going like the cows would have probably like behavioral issues and may not get as big and there's just a lot Whoa. of oh Damn, yeah, that never even entered my brain. That's, yeah, good on you. Let's not do that. Not a good idea. <laughs> what has, um, because I, I mean, I remember seeing you kind of post about this a while ago, um, but the backlash that you get on your social media from posting your hunting and posting the farm stuff, what what is that like? And where do you kind of pick and choose to like, or do you choose to filter that stuff now? Or you just say, F it, that it is what it is. So originally I did choose to filter, right? I worked for a publicly, a very public company um, that's very PG. And I was like, man, it's such a big part of my life, but I don't want to make people uncomfortable. You know, like a lot of people like being blind to where their food comes from. And if that's you, that's cool. Um, But I hunted this, I got my first like compound bow kill and I had been training, literally I'd shot today. Like I train almost every day to shoot a, animal with a bow and um you're a real life Katniss Everdeen and I respect it thank you um I um I got my first compound bow kill and it was a clean ethical ethical shot like she went like 20 yards and fell like I was so proud and I tried to take a super artsy shot right like I was in front of the deer you could see it was my hair you see the deer's butt like you could tell there was a deer but there was no like and it didn't matter that I try to be respectful. People still like death threats, threats against my future children, threats against Ray, threats against all this. And I was like, well, screw it. If you, yeah. if, if either way, you guys are like, like I lost probably 10,000 followers. Wow. So I, I was like, so like at, at one point you're like, man, like the cat's already out of the bag. Like I did it. Okay. This is a yeah. big part of my life. So if I'm getting so much attention for it anyway, I want to bring a ethical a light awareness to, it. to it. Yeah. Sure. Well, you know, it's like, I mean, obviously I don't hunt. I don't know anything about this world. Uh, my father-in-law hunts, so he knows all about it. So, I mean, I've, I've overheard his conversations about it. And, you know, I, I obviously get where you're coming from, especially like ethically and wanting to grow all your own stuff and all of that is fantastic. But when you see on social media, sort of like the backlash for what you're getting, where you are doing all of the right things as oh, a yeah. to <laughs> when you see somebody that's just out, like, you know, obviously when people lose their shit, as they should, when someone's out just like hunting a lion or an elephant or things like that, like those are such completely different things. What is like your viewpoint on where those two things kind of stand? So I guess where like I draw the line and what makes me like uh, there's hunts I wouldn't I simply wouldn't go on right like I said I don't like processing birds and eating birds so I don't bird hunt I would never go through the turmoil of hunting an elephant because how the hell am I supposed to get that meat home however I know there's a lot of like farmers in in like Africa that elephants wreak havoc on their ecosystems right they wreak havoc on their food and me if I went to Africa and I knew I was helping a local like a local town or something take down this elephant and they were going to eat the meat awesome but I'm not I I'm uncomfortable and I won't partake in it's called just trophy hunting Trophy now, hunting, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. There's definitely hunting you can do. You still can take a trophy from it and still use the meat. Uh, that's where like the line gets blurred. Cause when you, when you walk in my house, there's a huge deer head on the wall. Right. And 
to the naked eye or to the untrained, it looks like I just killed that thing and stuck its head on my wall. When in actuality, that is just the skin over a piece of styrofoam. I, and that it was an animal that fed your family. Uh, like the tenderloins, the back straps I got off this deer are like, like this, like to my like pubic bone to my head. They are humongous. Like it was the biggest deer. So like if you shoot, like if I shoot a mature buck, mm-hmm. yes, they happen to have bigger horns and they're, but they're more meat. If you shoot a mature animal, it restarts the kind of pecking order of everything. So the younger bucks are able to not get killed and they can put their genes. So it's, I like to be a part of the ecosystem when I hunt. Like if you go outside and you sit in the woods, like everything's trying to kill each other, Mm -hmm. but that's how things work. That's how things thrive. And, and I, I remember one of my first times going hunting, just kind of understanding, like, cause you're like, that's so beautiful. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to like end that, you know, like, like, look, it's doing its thing. It's doing its, but like deer don't die of old age, you know? Yeah. They usually get smoked by cars. They get hit by cars. They die of infection. They get eaten while they're still alive by predators. Like I, if I can deliver a clean heart shot on a deer, it doesn't know it got hit. It keeps walking. It gets tired. It falls asleep and it's dead. What do you recommend for people to be educated on this more so that people aren't freaking out on your social media and, you know, losing followers and all that? So there is a show. It kind of got Ray into hunting. It shows you a different side of it. It's, um, it's a guy called Steven Ranella, um, and it's a show on Netflix called Meat Eater. And this guy is a avid hunter. Like he grew up in Michigan. He started like trap hunting, hunting squirrels. And they would eat the squirrels and the rabbits. And this guy has gone from that all the way to hunting moose in Alaska. Like this dude's kind of been everywhere and he eats moose everything. Moose meat is delicious, by the way. Oh, it's, it, moose is probably the best meat I've ever had. If it's I was delicious. Being completely honest. Yeah, yeah it is. It's amazing. And people don't realize how big a moose is. Holy it's They're astonishing. Dinosaurs. Fuzzy yeah, dinosaurs. They are. <laughs> They're gigantic, like terrifying. For sure. Like if, if you have the balls to stand within 40 yards of a moose and shoot it. Awesome. Like you see like video of like a moose swimming. Jesus. Yeah. They're, they're so like, agile and they're goofy nuts. and frumpy. Yeah. yeah. They're crazy. But um, this okay. show on Netflix is called meat eater. Steven Ronella and this guy kind of showed Ray the, cause he didn't really want to hunt before he saw this show. Mm-hmm. It brings the story. Like a lot of hunting shows are like, yeah, we're in Ohio. Oh my God, there's a deer. Oh, dead. Yeah. Yeah. But like what's beautiful about hunting is the kill is the shortest part of hunting, the least exciting part of hunting. It's the setup. It's being in the woods. It's learning about where the deer go, how the deer are, like learning what the deer are up to. And then yeah. after you put it down, like that's where the work starts. Like the, the, the three seconds it takes to take the animal down are there's no feeling in that, you know, sure. like sure. it's, it's, it's kind of like wrestling. Like no one's gonna remember what you do. They're gonna remember how you made they're it feel. Yeah. Yeah. Same with True. hunting. So meat eater on Netflix is where I would, I would kind of start and then kind of goes from there. Branch out from there. Okay, great. Well, insightful. I think, um, I mean, I see all of your stuff on social media and yeah, I'm always like fascinated by just how you guys have your farm functioning. And, and so you guys are on such a meat eating diet it, like what's what is the ratio of like meat to vegetables to carbs and now cash is on that the video of him eating meat <laughs> with no little teeth blew my mind he like to he see him grab a pills? piece of meat How yeah he, he, he was he was five and a half when that video he's he's just turned six months he was five and a half when that video was taken to see him take a piece of meat without even knowing and go like this and rip it i'm like beautiful do your thing son like I love it so like me and Ray I don't eat any vegetables whatsoever I haven't in years um I eat carbs just because I'm cutting weight from being pregnant so but I'm still like 80 20 like meat heavy um yeah so like what I believe is humans were made to eat meat so like think about it this way so you're, you live in the woods back in the primitive days and you have 
three hours to get food. What is the most calorie dense way that you're going to eat? Are you going to spend those three hours picking berries and leaves for something who knows is going to kill you or your whole family? Or are you going to spend those three hours getting a deer down or a moose and have thousands upon thousands of calories for your time spent? So like the way I believe is that we can eat, we're omnivores, we can eat leaves and berries and all, but that's like survival food. That's like, we didn't, we weren't able to get an animal today. What do we do not to die? Like if you watch that show alone, those people, like, it's like, I've been watching naked and afraid a ton. Naked and afraid. What do people want? They want fat. Yes. Guy was trying to catch bats the other day. I don't recommend that. No. Yeah. Well, got us into this whole last year and (laughs) not get more coronavirus. Yes. Yeah. It's just as a whole and I need bats ever, but um, they want fat. You don't see people like, man, if I don't get these antioxidants from these berries, I'm going to die. No, you want something of fatty meat, like a fish or like any kind of. Yeah, keep that fish coming. Hell yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of believe that we function like there's a reason when people eat broccoli that your stomach bloats and you don't feel so hot, you know, like. My how, stom- how do you feel eating so much meat? And when you like fully converted over to it being sort of like that 80, 20 ratio. So the um, modern westernized version of me was wanting to kind of eat like lean meats, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to eat, you know, like lean fish and chicken and have like a l- l- less fatty steak and your fat ratio has to be so high. So like I've done low carb before, right? Like, Ugh. I was, I was the chubby girl Whoa. in Japan and I was trying to like cut that out when I was like 18, but, oh um, my God. I like, I eat only fatty meat. Like I eat 16 ounces of ribeye every day. Damn. Every day. And so like when I'm truly carnivore, like I live out in the middle of nowhere. So I eat the same thing. Like I can't just run down the road to freaking whatever restaurant. Um, I ate six eggs, six pieces of bacon for lunch. I ate two burger patties. And for dinner, I ate 16 ounces of ribeye. And because I was so nutrient dense, my period decided to come back six weeks postpartum while I'm still breastfeeding. Wow. My body's like, we're, we have, we're nutrient dense. We're ready. I was kind of offended because I was not ready to have more kids <laughs> mentally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, I will like, I believe you were just eating for health. Like if you just want to be the healthiest version you can be. Being animal based is the way to go. Now, animal based means mostly like animal products. And I'm talking nose to tail, like organ meats, kidneys, heart, nose to tail. And fruits don't like necessarily like upset your stomach. Cause like, okay, if you're a plant, right? I'm a plant. I don't want things eating my leaves. If something eats my leaves, I as a plant die, I'm done. If you eat the fruit of my plant, I'll eat the fruit, the animal goes around, the animal poops, more plants pop up. So a plant's defense when you eat it is to poison you because it doesn't want you to eat the plant because the plant's going to die. It's trying to survive, right? So like the, like fruits and things like that, the plant wants you to eat because that's how the plant reproduces. So like, I believe that like, that's why when you eat broccoli and you eat a lot of leafy greens that your body is kind of gassy and bloated and love all those things keep me nice and bloated baby (laughs) (laughs) my favorite and like you can look up any diet of anywhere and convince yourself that this is the healthiest way to go and it's and it's all about like how you feel like I have bad allergies and I like my stomach especially when I first got caught up to WWE my stomach was wrecked and I didn't know why like I couldn't understand I was like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And it wasn't until I went completely carnivore, my inflammation, like my allergies, especially like my, my face got so much better. And my stomach was night and day. Cause what race, kind of diet were you on then before? I just ate healthy. You know, I had vegetables yeah. and leaner meats and made sure, you know, I had, a, yeah, you know, the kind of the, the food pyramid diet. Right. Don't get me started on the food pyramid. That'll be a whole other <laughs> podcast. <laughs> we'll but, save uh, it for another episode. <laughs> I'm going to turn this into a nutrition show where I don't know <laughs> about it. I just ask you a bunch of questions. You're like, we're I drink a thousand iced coffees a day. I'm like, tell me everything. <laughs> um, all right. So 
you're full carnivore baby is carnivore how is little cash how is being a mom how is mom life treating you ray can you bring me cash oh yes hi ray cash is fantastic he's um six months he's uh 21 and a half pounds exclusively breastfed unless he chews on meats um his poops are smelly uh, hi uh, Lava. hi you want to come see oh hi buddy he never wears clothes who needs them hi little man he's there hi Hi, Did you come Hi. oh my god hi bud oh my god how stinking cute <laughs> hi oh my god i love people's babies so much now that i have a baby i did it, it it really makes you like be like oh, i don't need another kid that you see another baby and you're like oh. beam me up especially like it's so funny seeing kids of like people that like you know both their parents and like seeing that like combo of them mm-hmm. it's such a little trip hi cash man <laughs> hi little meat man he just oh had a uh, a nap so he's you sound pretty good So how do you juggle being at home, being a mom and, and stepping away from wrestling, which you have done for so long. Yeah. um, Switching gears into this mode. I know that can't always be easy. So as a child, my, um, my family were like in survival mode constantly. My, both my parents were, um, for the most part, like working, we saw them when they weren't at work and like, we moved around a lot and there was a lot of like consistency in my life just because we didn't have much, you know? And, um, it's so important to me to be consistent and like involved in his life as like kind of possible. Um, Ray's fan, Ray, uh, grew up with like a big Catholic family. Like he has, uh, four other brothers and sisters and we have, like I said, 10 nieces and nephews, 11, including cash and, um, the family dynamic family you got over there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's why. (laughs) Very careful. Yeah, uh, careful with that period. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I, like, I want to, like, homeschool, and I want to have him kind of grow up here. Like, we're going to really make sure we're diligent and, like, extracurricular activities. Like, we're going to be, like, FFA, and there's a bunch of, um, like, 4-H, and there's a bunch of local hike groups and camp groups and, like, all this stuff. I'm going to be that mom that, like, doesn't know where to go because I'm doing so many things for my kid. But um, I... I don't really like shockingly the way I live. I'm not really super big on the public school system. So I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to kind of cultivating like our little family here. And I I feel like we're perfect candidates for homeschooling because we have so many like little odds and ends and jobs here that we do that I can just incorporate kind of, you know, math, science, arithmetic, all that kind of stuff into kind of our daily lives and be more I'm gonna like obviously I'm gonna be like open but be more laxed when it comes to his schooling as long as we're hitting you know certain markers and um just kind of like let him lead and like support and educate the best I can with like his interests you know does that like, over, does that like overwhelm you at all thinking about like, cause honestly, even like the idea of like Nora going to school and big, like, I'm never going to know what she's talking about. And I'm like, wait, what is this like class you're yeah. taking? What's happening? Like that overwhelms me. And I don't have to be in the driver's seat for that, where I can just like, you know, I can help obviously as much as I can when she right. brings stuff home, but for you to be the one to be like kind of doling out these lessons and keeping him up to whatever level kids need to be at for each grade and all that, like, how do you wrap your head around that? So one thing, we are going to homeschool him until high school and then send him to St. Ignatius where is where Ray went. Um, and also um, Ray's sister homeschools five kids. Okay. And um, she's, so she, she was like, there's plenty of different ways to homeschool. She's like, there's a more structured approach where you kind of get a kind of like a syllabus from a online thing, or there's an unstructured approach where you can just kind of make sure the standardized testing is kind of being hit and you just kind of teach, you know, kind of follow your kids, but make sure they're kind of hitting these markers. Cause surprisingly, I don't know how this is in other countries. I haven't dug that deep into this yet, but you don't need a high school education to go to college. Really? So say that cash doesn't want to go to high school, right? He's doing great. He's 
on a, he's doing a bunch of like extra clicker things. This kid is busy, but he loves math. For instance, he can go to community college as a teenager, get two years of community college. Well, that will be enough for him to go to any college he wants, Harvard, any Ivy league school, anything like that. It shocked me because I've been doing a lot of research. Like, granted, my kid's only six months old. So, like, I'm trying to, like, you well, know, Well, good to get ahead absorb. of it. Like, the time flies so quick that all <laughs> yes. of a sudden you're like, wait, I wish I did some of that research because I have no idea what's going on. And that's exactly like a whole can of worms. Like, I'm sure people will be up in <laughs> arms about this, too. <laughs> yes. So, like, it blew my mind that kids don't need a high school education to go to uh, college. And a lot of, like, people are like, you know, if you're homeschooled, like your kids will be homeschooled, like, why would you do that to them? They're going to be so socially awkward. Right. If we just kept cash here at the house, didn't socialize him and homeschooled him and all the interaction he had was with me and Ray, any kid, any person would be weird hanging out with me for that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do like our, like I said, he has 11, he has 10 other nieces and nephews currently. And we plan on having more kids and we're going to do our best to, there's so many like group activities sports you name it that he can kind of get involved in that just don't include him going to a public school you know so sure sure that's I'm gonna kind of keep it open like say if he's in fifth grade and he's like mom I really want to go to school all right dude cool go to school yeah you know like I want I just want what's best for him you know I feel like that's what all parents at the end of the day are doing what they think is best for their kids so you can't really yeah and you know, I think so much I, for that. Yeah. And I think also, I'm sure there's so many people that are in the same boat again, given this past year and a half when kids have been home and parents have had to step up and do the <sighs> education system with their kids. Like, I can't imagine how difficult that is. Luckily, I just got to be pregnant in that home during all of that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about any of like the, the repercussions of, of things like that, of having your kids at home and educating them and all that. But yeah, just like putting them on the right track. For me, like I want my kids to go to school and to play sports and do all these things so that they understand other authority figures. That's the thing for me of like, I want Uh, them to like, to know, to respect other people. And again, I mean, yeah, they can get that through these other things that you're saying through Mm -hmm. different programs and whatnot, but that's just something that like, I I worry about my kids not listening to me or something after a while being like, can you like (laughs) understand this from somebody else? Cause you're just mom. And what do you know? I mean, that's a valid, very valid point. Like it. And also with like homeschooling, like a lot of parents don't pick what's best for them as well. Like you understand that you are the one giving this information and you're the one that's going to be working harder than your freaking kid is for this. Yeah. So like, it has to be something that you also can want to and are passionate about doing like if yeah. you hate every part of homeschooling and you're trying to your kids not going to give a <laughs> if you don't give a <laughs> you know so yeah. that's definitely a and who knows I could be like I'm homeschool my kid I can get to second grade and be like screw this this kid's Never mind. you know so yeah. yeah I'm very I'm open to like like I thought I, I was positive I was gonna have a home birth and it just didn't go that way you know so like you got to be open to other ventures stick and move, see what else kind of comes up and f- yeah, see what you got to adjust to for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's so crazy thinking about like the world that our kids are going to grow up in. And I feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit older Scary. than you, but like we were able to still grow up without social media, without our phones that we had to like get outside and do stuff. And that's something I get so worried about with, with Nora is being like, geez, like, what is she going to grow up with? Like going to school and like what the bullying is like and what social media can be like and trying to protect her from those things, but also not wanting her to not know what things are. I don't want to give her a disadvantage of not knowing yeah. things, but could, could you imagine like, that line, that balance? Yeah. Could you imagine like being at school all the time? That's what like social media is for me. Like, could you yeah. imagine going to school, getting home and not being able to go home and like the school comes with you, totally. the taunting and the bullying comes with you. Like that is, yeah. that's awful. It makes so oh. like, it makes me it's so sad. Anxiety. It <laughs> does. Understand. It is. It's really sad. It is. It's so sad that like our kids just like, don't, they won't have that. And I don't know what it'll be like by the time our kids are in school and they're able to understand all of those things. And I mean, I know kids can be mean, but there's also sort of like that fine line of 
like I, I, you know, I didn't really get bullied or anything in high school, but I mean, I've gotten in fights and we had to sort it out and it was never yeah, a thing yeah. of like, have it. That's how kids should have to learn how things go. You should know how that is. Yeah, but experience now life. everyone's so protect protected that they don't get to experience anything or everyone just wants to like call in an authority to come in and sort out all their problems for them. And, and it's like never the kids fall. And like, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah it's for scary. sure. Oh, I can't wait for the future. What a good time. What a good time. It's either um, we're at, I feel like we're at this point where something get a lot better or a lot worse. Like we totally. can't, it's not, we can't it's gonna either hit a breaking longer. point. I hope that it, I just wanted to like bottom out and be like, okay, we actually, why did we all do social media for so long? And why do we all think that it was so important? I would love for it all to just kind of go away, but there's such a currency that comes with it. And I mean, I feel that with my social media that there's times that I'm like, God, it's such a tall order to keep up with things. And trying to appease everybody yeah. and like it's impossible that it becomes just so much more work and you think about it you're right you you never stop working it it's bringing your work home you're constantly on there like sifting through stuff your brain's working way more than it needs to yeah and not just having regular conversations with like the people that are in the room with you dude me and ray had a this morning actually like an in-depth conversation about how like i'm i i like say cash, say something happens and cash is my only kid. Like I would be distraught if he was on the floor playing or something. And I'm not soaking that up. I'm not soaking that in. So I'm just mindlessly scrolling on Facebook, like, like, or Instagram or whatever. I'm like being on my phone. Like, is it, it doesn't fill me up. Like it's not fulfilling. It leaves me feeling empty. And like, cause it's never enough. Cause there's always something new. Always, and I'm like, yeah. like, let's just kind of be satisfied and be present in where we are yeah. instead of always in someone else's crap. Like let's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, you're always just sifting through someone's garage sale, like checking out everything they have and sifting through things and not being able to just pay attention and be fully present. Having a kid is a great way to check yourself with that. Cause yeah, you yes. don't want to miss out on any little thing and looking on your phone when you've got like this adorable little baby in front of yeah. you, like, what are you doing? Get this phone at like, throw my phone in the trash. Um, okay. So getting into like some wrestling stuff with you, like you said, I mean, you've been wrestling since you were 18, you said 17, 17, traveling all over being in Japan, working in the independent scene, yeah. getting your opportunity in WWE. What was your kind of takeaway from your time in WWE and being able to work with the riot squad and the, the bond that you guys were all able to form? So that's like a two parter. So wrestling, just in general, wrestling will never love you as much as you love it ever. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing I learned, like finally, like making it to the top, you know, like, you know, I've went from wrestling at state fairs and horse stalls in Kentucky to, you know, freaking wrestling in Madison, Madison square garden, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and it's never like, I think wrestling can make you happy. Like and give you bursts of happiness, but I don't think it can like fulfill you. Cause it's a TV show at the end of the day, you know? So like, I, I think you should definitely let wrestling make you happy, but you got to be careful with how it makes you feel. Cause it can be very, very unfulfilling. Like, even if you are at the top, no telling how long, how long it's going to last. And if you're one of those lucky few people who, no matter what you do, you're kind of solid in the company. Like, that's awesome. But I, you know, kind of, I've been everywhere. I've been from the Indies, like I said, to WWE and, you know, Ring of Honor, NXT, Shine, Shimmer. I mean, every company you could think of, like I've pretty much, besides like TNA and AEW, I've been there. But the rest is like a drug. Like it can never be enough and you'll never stop, even though it's not yeah. never enough. Um, but real things do happen. Like the riot squad, like that's a real thing. That's real relationships and real bonding that like every big moment of each of our lives, like me, Liv and Dory have been together. All of our big wrestling things all. And like, even if I didn't like them, we're bonded forever because yeah. we just share those experiences. Like, so, and now Dory lives 10 minutes from me. Like I convinced her to move to, Ooh. Yeah, Yay, I didn't know she was that close to you. I got missed her to move here and um she's Cash's godmom. So yeah. So I've known her since before WB. Like I've been me and her used to be like joined at the hip because we lived within three hours of each other. So every show on the indies, 
she was just there yeah and she's just someone who's like always been there you know so Mm -hmm. the riot squad was definitely something that like i'll like treasure forever but in wrestling fashion that got taken away from us in a day which was very dumb by the way, which it, we know, we know that was very dumb. Yeah, it was very like, just like, you know, feeling like irrelevant is never fun. No, you know, it, it, you got, we were in Montreal when that happened, right? Yeah, I because like I in Montreal, like you guys yes. in the locker room being like devastated. Because it was such a weird day for me that day because I'm devastated the Riot Squad's breaking up and my husband is debuting on my dinner. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's what it was. I'm yeah. like, oh, yay. Oh. It was. I was emotionally exhausted by the end of that day. Like there could not have been a more like pulling yeah. of strings, you know, it was just, and wrestling, I always love wrestling. I will be back to wrestling eventually. I'm no one ever retires. You either die or, you know, no one quits. Yeah. Riff Flair's still wrestling. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he's free from his contract and he's ready to lace up some boots. Oh God. Yeah. He's, he's, he's just having the best time of his life all the time. <laughs> yeah. I've gotten my best friends from wrestling. I've got my husband from wrestling. Like it's, it will always be a huge part of my life, but like, I couldn't imagine, especially like exclusively breastfeeding, like going to WWE and having a match and uh, it just uh. wouldn't be, I want to breastfeed for like two years. And yeah. I know the longer it goes on, the, you know, the less, you know, demanding it's going to be like, it'll probably end up just being like a nighttime morning night kind of thing Mm -hmm. or for like comfort. But right now, like, um, like he mostly like chews on meat and he'll like eat a little bit, but I'm, I'm his main source of food. And obviously he's a very hungry child. So I couldn't imagine. Yeah. I couldn't imagine like, being in the WWE or in any wrestling scene with that like looming in my head that like so I, I, I'll be back eventually I just don't know where when what or how <laughs> how is it um having Ray still be in WWE and doing everything that he's doing and, and you being back at home does that like just watching him do his thing how does what does that do to you I'm mostly thankful that he's still there. Um, He's why we're able to have the things we have now, like legitimately, Mm -hmm. like I've never in my life let someone like take care of me, Um, but he's doing a tremendous job of it. And like, I, I'll to be honest, it's hard for me to watch like WWE television because like, you know, it's, it's an unclosed chapter in my life in my, in my opinion. But I never get anything but happy watching Ray's matches. Like, I'll watch Raw just so we can watch his match. And it's, I've known Ray, me and Ray were together before WWE. Like, I know his struggle. I know his, his, what obstacles he had to overcome to get, to get in that seat, you know, to eat at that table. And I'm thankful that he's there for our sake. I love that he's there for his sake. And um, I don't want him to ever, you know, not work there if that's what he wants to do, you know? Yeah, of course. What, um, what was your relationship with Vince? Like, um, we had like a few conversations, but it wasn't like, I wasn't like, Hey, Z, you know, like, (laughs) Hey buddy, (laughs) you're the tightest relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) I growled at him one time. So thought he growled at me. Oh my God. I forgot about this story. (laughs) What happened there again? Oh my God. I totally remember you telling me this. (laughs) So we were at tribute to the troops and I'm like, my mind's blown because I come from a very military background family and Vince walks by with his entourage and he goes, ladies, And I go, hi, sir. <laughs> and he like stops and it keeps going. And Dory grabs me and she goes, Sarah, did you just growl if it's a bear? I was like, he growled at me first. And she was like, Sarah, he was clearing his throat. He wasn't growling at you. I was like, oh, I thought we were doing like the you growl, I growl. <laughs> oh my God. So he That's probably thinks I'm a deranged psychopath. Great. But um, <laughs> my last, my final day in the WWE um, actually went into Vince's office. And, um, I, so I had it in my brain, like, I'm going to go in there and just be mean and give a piece of my mind and blah, 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 blah. And I went in there and was the most professional 
POS that I've ever been in my life. And (laughs) because like, again, wrestling doesn't owe me anything at all. It's given me more than I could ever have hoped for. And I went in there and I was like, this has always been my dream job. I lived it. It's given me my best friend and my husband and now my child. I was like, just thank you. And I hope we meet again someday. And I shook his hand and left. And I was like, I one part of you wants to be like, blah, 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 blah. I just yell and she have all these feelings. And the other part of you is like, but like, who would have thought some small town girl from Eastern Kentucky whose family had never left Kentucky would have wrestled the Bellas of Ronda Rousey in Australia, who's wrestling in Madison Square Garden, who's going to all, who's going to Madrid, Spain and wrestling. Like I wasn't supposed to do any of that, you know? So like, yeah. And it's just, I, I can't, I couldn't sit there and act like I was pissed because I, I was a heartbroken. Yes. Yeah. But like, I'm not mad or angry or any, like, I, I had the best time of my life there and my life's still getting better. So it was just and a, you're so young still, you've got so much time. Yeah, I'm 27. You, so. Like, come on now. Yeah. You're babes. Um, what were some of the conversations that you got, that you were having? I don't know if you were having these directly with Vince or not, but when you guys were sort of developing your character within the riot squad, I know you, there's many conversations about makeup. <laughs> you didn't ever want to wear makeup and you wanted your hair and your dreads. And that was like very much you, but that's never the thing that exists within WWE. So I think it threw him for a loop. Um, actually he was really cool about it to me. Um, I don't know what was said elsewhere, but like I, so like this kind of makeup is fine with me, right? Just like my mm-hmm. eyes or something, but like the WWE kind of makeup, I would, watch my matches back and I'm like that doesn't look like me and that for me bothered me yeah just me personally like I don't know if I should have gotten over it or whatever but like it it bothered me personally and I was I was talking about it and someone was like go tell him go tell him you don't want to wear any makeup so I was like everybody's gassing up I was like yeah I was gonna and I went in there and I was like Vince I don't like wearing makeup it makes my eyes hurt I don't think I need it I don't want to wear it. And he's like, I think your face is pretty expressive, is expressive enough not to wear makeup. And I was like, I do too. And he was like, all right. I was like, all right, thank you. And I left. And I was like, I walked out and I was like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Did Should I have said more? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just stopped, stopped wearing it. Um, I felt better about myself, you know, like I, being feminine has always been super hard for me. Um, I grew up with four brothers and it just never was a thing. Like I, I, I never knew what my feminine side was. I only knew what my normal tomboy dude side was, you know, the, so like trying to, like, I'm trying to do this now. Like I've been kind of doing it for a couple months now, like trying to find like my feminine side and what that means and who that is and kind of how far I want to go with it. Ray's been fantastic. He, he's my like fashion dude like <laughs> he's like the way your body is and the way this is cut and like this and, it. and he's just he's just awesome with it he's like the sister I never had who I'm also married <laughs> to and have children with <laughs> and uh he he's just been so supportive of me like finding that out and like just kind of trying new things and you know trial and error for sure yeah. but we're I'm, I'm kind of getting there kind of finding like my my style and because when I come back to wrestling like I want to, I'm there to make money now, you know, I got a family like, so I'm going to have to kind of put my uncomfortableness and just swallow it. And I'm comfortable being uncomfortable in the sense that I'm comfortable with, if that makes sense. (laughs) Like, well, it's it's the growth and the change of it. Something like now it's a thing that you want to explore. That is the thing of like figuring that out. And it's not, you know, I think even using the word uncomfortable is like, 
it's like anything being like, can I wear these pants? Can I pull off this look? Is this a me thing? And until you can actually like walk down the street and you're like, yeah, f- that this is my look right now. Right. Yeah. It, it's hard. It's hard. Sometimes you feel like everyone's looking at you or like, oh, God, <laughs> people are talking about this, whatever. But I really love that you were posting about that, about like connecting with your feminine side and figuring out what your what your femininity was. Is that something do you find being a, a mom has helped kind of catapult you into that as well? Yeah, I've uh, like my birth, like as traumatic as it was, gave me kind of a confidence and a a like a surety in myself um, mm-hmm. because like I went through some with my birth, like I had an unmedicated freaking C-section, you know, like it was, it was life changing and something like I'm still like processing. So I kind of realized in another level about how kind of like badass I am and how badass moms are in general. And I was like, I, I've kind of found that me pushing against the grain, especially WWE. Like I did, I was like, I'm not wearing makeup. I'm not wearing a dress. I'm not wearing my outlier kind of personality, which seemed like a lot of confidence in myself as a person, which there is like, I know exactly the hell I am, but like, I wasn't, I wasn't secure enough in myself to try anything different also, you know? Right. right. I wasn't like me wearing this kind of stuff. Isn't going to change who I am. It's just, it's just an outfit. But now right. I'm trying to find just that outfit, but also that it's me. So it's, we, we've been working through some stuff here. <laughs> at <laughs> Yeah. It's, but it, it's interesting. And like, it, I mean, I think that we're all kind of always going through these different evolutions of like, okay, this is who I was, you know, six months ago to a year ago to 10 years ago. Yeah. And there's pieces of those identity that you hold, you know, very near and dear and those make up who we are. But as we change and we evolve and we grow, it's, it's cool to kind of dip your toe into these other things, whether it's the way you look, the way you talk, the things that you're watching, the things that you're reading, the way you do your sure. makeup, like it's cool to sort of start to tack on these newer parts of yourself to kind of grow and evolve into this next woman that you're going to be. And it's important to surround yourself with people who like support that and that it's yeah. okay. You know, like I've been in relationships where like, you know, you change how you do your hair, you change something like you're changing. Like, no, I'm still fundamentally, I'm still the same person. And it just, it just takes people secure in themselves and their relationships and all that stuff to Mm -hmm. allow any kind of change. That's even like superficial change, like what you wear, what you, you know, like I'm going to start eating just meats like why that's not what you used to do I know but like this is this is a new what thing I want to try out yeah. yeah so Ray has been a huge part in like giving me like the confidence and that like extra extra pep in my step to kind yeah. of embrace it and because like my family if I would have walked in with they're like the hell, the hell you doing like and I'm like oh nothing just like <laughs> we're back in my room and change. <laughs> nothing wipe off the makeup you saw nothing look away because <laughs> yeah, exactly. you and you and Rhonda um ended up developing like a, a pretty cool relationship it I seemed, I mean, it seems yeah. like you guys are really cut from the same cloth because I mean obviously based off of the farming stuff and now she's stepping into motherhood she's going yeah. through all that to to even her adjusting to her time in WWE and I mean you even look at like sitting in the makeup chair and she had to sit and figure out what's going to work for her and bringing in her people to for do sure. that but did you guys bounce a lot of stuff off of each other through that time um makeup wise and stuff no um but we're we're on we're honestly closer like after WWE than we were like like Ron is always in someone I that's been super easy for me to talk to always super awesome to kind of just hang out with um Mm -hmm. but after I got released um I and we we you know she was you know she went through all her troubles and stuff trying to you know trying to be a mom and and I was going through like the pregnancy and and we we were pretty much talking like every day And she just became someone that I, like when my chickens got massacred by a hawk, like she was the person to FaceTime me and like, while I was freaking crying and she's, I feel like Rhonda has been in such a singular sport for so long. It was really like, I think it, I can't speak for her obviously, but I think it was really special for her to be like part of a team aspect, like in WWE. 
And um, she was always like I said, she was the female version of Kurt Angle. Like she just took to wrestling so naturally and had such a great attitude. And you tell she loved to be there, which I loved, you know. Well, thanks for coming on the show, girl. It was a lot of fun to see you and just to see your face and hear about everything that's going on with you. I mean, from everything at the farm to this book that's going to be coming out. I can't wait to hear more about that. And yeah. And eventually at some point, get a, get some boots back on you and get you back to wrestling. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for all that life has to bring. I'm, I'm looking forward, trying to be present, but look forward to the future. It's very, Mm. very taxing on the mind, Sure, but thank you for having me on. I've, burping um your uh, <laughs> your your podcast are like taking off and you've had like lots of cool guests and you know you knew merch so you're, you're doing yeah, freaking... you merch <laughs> like oh this little thing this thing you're I doing have? fantastic in all things Thank and you. still being a kick-ass mom so kudos to you you're yeah I don't think people know how like inspirational that is because you're just living your freaking life every day and just doing the thing but I'm sure Best. people are like man I I'm going to do a little extra today because Renee's getting up every day and cooking <laughs> and making books and having podcasts. Yeah, so. and that's what we got to do, right? We got to kind of just keep everybody on the ball and keep moving forward and try to find new things to do as, oh, yes. as we grow and we develop and we become these, these people that we are continuing to be. We're not changing. We're growing bitches. <laughs> I am mother nature. Yeah, (laughs) here we are. All right. I will let you get back to your sweet little baby and um, hopefully get that new cow soon. Fingers crossed. 